welcome in everybody. I am so excited that you chose to spend a little bit of your day with us. We are really excited to dive into the webinar. All right. So we are going to be chatting through today, the modern framework for measuring and optimizing agency profitability using three simple metrics. Anybody can track. Obviously I'm an accountant. I'm a VCFO here at um, Summit Virtual CFO by Andrew. So we are going to be speaking my love language today. I am really excited to dive into this with, with everyone. I am going to be the facilitator today. My name is Hannah Hood. I, like I said, I'm a virtual CFO here at Summit Virtual CFO by Anders, but I'm also the podcast host for the Young CPA Success Show. Y'all may not exactly be our target audience. However, I do invite you to come listen and see if there's any relevant content because we do get to talk to some really amazing people on the podcast. A few housekeeping items, please use the question and answer function in this Zoom session. I will be monitoring that and we will cover those questions. Marcel is also going to be keeping his eyes on it. So if there's something he can answer as we go, he's going to do that. But we are going to have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of this where you can get all of those questions in. Um, replay slides and the email with all of this will be sent to you within two business days. So you will also have that to refer back to as well. I just want to give you all a little bit of background about who we are as a firm. If you don't already know us as such, we started um, as Summit CPA Group in 2002 by Jody Grundon and Adam Hale, who you can see in the first picture, respectively. Um, in 2004, we started offering uh, CFO and back office accounting services as a service offering in addition to tax and audit services um, that most traditional CPA firms offer. In 2013, we became a fully distributed firm, which is really ahead of the wave of that remote working wave. So they've always really kind of been ahead of, ahead of their time. In um, 2022, Summit joined uh, Anders CPA and Advisors via a merger. And through that, obviously, we became a much larger team. We have our virtual CFO team that grew. We also have an in-person team in St. Louis at Anders CPAs and Advisors. And we also have people who work for us in a hybrid setting. So that is our intro. I'm going to turn this over to Marcel Petipa, who is going to be our guest on today's uh, webinar and sharing and gleaning all of this wisdom and knowledge with, with us. All right. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you, everyone, for being here. This is a really cool full circle moment. And just to kind of tie back to the timeline that Hannah just shared, you know, I started this company, Parakeeto, about five years ago. And one of the first people that I met that really had a tremendous impact on my way of thinking as it relates to agency finance and operations data was Jody Grundon. And his book, Digital Dollars and Cents, really laid the groundwork for a lot of the ideas that, you know, I, I think we've taken to a deeper level on the operation side of running a digital marketing firm or really any kind of professional services business. And so this is a very cool full circle moment for me to be able to collaborate with the firm that, you know, Jody had a part in starting and being able to bring a lot of this deep thinking that we've done on these ideas that were started here back to this context and really have a thoughtful discussion today. I'm hoping about how to bridge that gap between what's happening on your P&L and what you do every single day as it relates to people, projects, and time that can really allow you to start taking control of your fate and start dictating where the PNL is going and having confidence that it's going in the right direction in between those kind of larger financial reporting touch points. So that's the mission for today. And I hope that uh, you're all as excited about it as Hannah and I are, uh, which is unlikely, but if you're even 10% <laughs> as excited as we are, then you're gonna have a lot of fun, I hope. And maybe for the next few minutes, y'all can just pretend that you're excited, okay? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> it would be very nice for my ego if uh, you seemed like you were having fun. That's right. uh, so with that, uh, just give everybody a little bit of context. As I mentioned before, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Parakeeto, and we specialize in helping digital agencies and consulting firms measure and improve their profitability. We're not accountants and we're not CPAs, so we're not gonna file your taxes. Unlike Hannah, I don't actually have a uh, formal education in finance. We focus on the other side of this, which is the operations side. So when you're getting great financial reporting from your accounting firm, we want to then start measuring the things that happen every day in the business so we can get more precise about where we're focusing our energy to actually improve the performance of the business and get more timely and specific measurement into what's going on that can help our team take more ownership over that process. 
Um, I've also been the host of a podcast called the Agency Profit Podcast for a number of years now. You'll never guess what we talk about on that show. <laughs> so uh, if you enjoy anything that we talk about today, by all means, go check that out. And I've also been fortunate to apply some of this knowledge at SAS Academy with Dan Martell, where I'm helping software companies get more sophisticated about how they factor services into their business model, which uh, is coming back in style. Services are coming back in style. So you hear, you heard it here first. Um, <laughs> So with that, uh, one of my favorite parts of my job is speaking. The only thing I like more than talking is hearing myself talk. And so I'm really grateful for another opportunity to do that here today. Uh, and I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to get on lots of great stages, including the Bureau of Digital, which is where Jody and I first met in Utah, I think it was, at an ops camp. And uh, it's been a bromance ever since. So thank you for having me, Hannah. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. So I want to talk about the problem that I think a lot of firms face when it comes to answering the questions that we need to answer every single day in our business. And if you run a firm or you're an operations executive in a firm, you know that every day there are questions that you're trying to wrestle with as everything in the business changes. You know, do we need to hire people? What kind of skills are they going to need? When do we need to hire them? And how does that change if we do or we don't get this contract? And what kinds of things are making us more money than others? And who's busier than we expect them to be? And who's not as busy as we expect them to be? And these are the kinds of questions that without data, we have to make a lot of decisions based on gut. And sometimes it can feel like the critical functions in the business are all kind of doing their own thing. They're working very hard, but maybe there's not alignment. And maybe we don't have a shared vision on what we actually need to be focused on and why. And the reason from my perspective that this is such a challenge is because in order to answer those questions on a timely basis, we need to coordinate not only ideas and concepts, but also actual data between these three critical functions in the business. And we need to do it in a way that allows us to draw clear lines between these things and how they impact each other. So for example, if the leadership team said, hey, we want to grow the business by a million dollars next year. Well, that's going to impact finance because they need to update their models and their budgets and their forecasts to reflect that. And operations and delivery also now had, need to figure out how are we going to staff up for that? How is that going to impact our operational targets for things like utilization and average billable rates? And if you've run a firm and you've tried to get a grasp on these things, you know that creating that coordination and keeping all of these stakeholders aligned is a really tall task because unfortunately this situation is not static and something is changing every day in at least one of these departments. And it can really become this head spinning kind of context changing exercise to try and keep tabs on all of these things. Um, Hannah, does that resonate at all with your experience working with clients? <laughs> Yeah, it really does. I feel like this is really a dance in terms of between the finance and the ops is like, we're doing a dance together. And especially as we start to learn and I start to see my clients really start to get in rhythm and in sync with that, we can start anticipating the other one's moves. We can see ahead and not be trying to run our business from the rear view mirror of the car. We're actually looking very clearly out into the future of where we want our business to go. And so that is why these pieces, you can have one and then not be really great in the other. And then the dance is all out of rhythm. So that is why all of these working together in sync is so incredibly important. And I've seen that in action with all of the clients that I work with. And that's something that is so special about Summit CPA and now uh, virtual CFO is that you have more context on operations of delivery and sales because you've designed that into your service model. And that's not very common. Most finance firms, you know, it's very hard for them to start to get out of this finance box and get enough context on like, how does the day to day actually work? What data is happening, you know, in, in terms of people, time and projects. And the same thing is true about the sales CRM. And so, um, without this kind of very special situation where you really do have the knowledge and the comfort level to stretch out and start to meet operations and delivery in the middle, often what we can find is that there's a seam here where things are falling through the cracks. And what makes this even more difficult is when we ask firms, whose job is it to sit in the middle and do this, to bring the data together, to get it aligned, to report back to all these stakeholders about what's happening so they're all on the same page, we get one of two answers. The first is, I didn't know that was a job someone was supposed to be doing. <laughs> and therefore no one's doing it. And then of course, well, then it makes sense that this feels hard. Or the other answer that we get often is, you know, we're asking one or several of these people to kind of stretch outside of the scope of their work to try and cover this gap. And it just doesn't feel like it's clicking. People are doing this off the side of their desk and it's challenging. 
right? It's, it's hard to expect anyone to do a good job of this if it's their full-time job, but even more so if it's something that someone's doing kind of as a side gig uh, to their main squeeze, which would be running the delivery team or closing business. And so this is kind of the problem that Parakeeto exists to try and solve is really to introduce a framework and help introduce systems that allow the data from all these different places to come together and be able to create clarity on the questions that you're asking yourself every day. So I wanted to frame that up just so everyone has some context on, you know, why what we're talking about is important and how it really applies to the day to day in the business. I'm going to get hydrated. I encourage everyone to do the same. <laughs> we're going to take frequent hydration breaks today. That's exactly right. While you're doing that, I would say that most of my clients who have somebody who sit in that middle spot, who can be the in-between and the communicator between the two and the identifier of those problems are far more successful than the ones that are trying to <clears throat> kind of, like you said, have somebody stretch a muscle that they're just not great at. And so that position is key in terms of bridging the gap, like you said. So that is something that I've seen in action with my clients. And to kind of frame up the next uh, section that we're going to talk about here, there are a couple of things that need to happen in this area for this to be successful. The first is there's execution that needs to happen, right? We need to be collecting data. We need to be keeping that data schema consistent. We need to be catching errors in the data, making sure that it's complete. Like there's a lot of tactical execution that needs to happen. But the more important underlying thing is we need to have a framework that makes these things consistent so that when we push on one lever, we know how it's going to impact everything else. And where I see this start to get really, really overwhelming for someone that isn't seasoned in this area is all the micro decisions that need to get made about every metric that lead them to a place where they're not actually consistent with one another. And I've heard this conversation. I'm sure you've had this conversation as well, where a CEO comes to me and he's like, this doesn't make sense operations and delivery, they're hitting their utilization targets, all the projects are on budget, our sales team's hitting quota, and yet our PNL is 15% lower on the bottom line than we expect it to be. What's going on? And when we double click into it, it's because, well, you're measuring utilization, that's great, but how exactly are you defining someone's capacity? And what's included in that and what's not? And how exactly do you define a billable hour? And what counts as a billable hour and what doesn't? And the nuances of those decisions are so critically important and it took us years to work through all of the details to make sure that these things were completely consistent with one another. And we were accounting for all the costs that needed to get accounted for, but we're doing it in the right place and in the right way. So all of this doesn't become incredibly cumbersome to keep track of. So that's something I wanna impress upon everyone is I'm gonna to try to clarify how to measure these things. And it's gonna seem crazy simple and that's by design. We wanted to mm -hmm. make it as simple and easy as possible, but make make no mistake we have considered all of the costs of you know holidays and time off and utilization and overhead they're all in here but we've tried to do this in a way that makes it as easy as possible to keep track of this without a ton of operational drag and this is one thing that i try to get aligned with my clients on especially as we're onboarding somebody new in the very beginning we have to make sure that we're speaking the same language about these things going forward and that is one piece that i've seen can be challenging for some owners that they've always seen it in this one way so it can be hard for them to wrap their head around a different way but getting aligned on the language and how we calculate these things and how we look at them going forward is critical for the success of your business yeah Absolutely. So here's the promise for today. I'm going to try to cover three things. Number one, clear metrics and benchmarks for finance and operations that will allow those two kind of areas of the business to come together and then be able to speak to sales and be aligned when we do that. And we're going to talk about how to create a framework that creates repeatable outcomes in the business. And to your point, Hannah, it gets everybody speaking the same language. And when we talk about a metric, everybody knows exactly what we're talking about, how it's calculated, what it means, and how to think about it. And ideally, what this can also allow us to do is create alignment and predictability in the business model. Because if we use these building blocks, we can look out into the future now. Just by doing simple math, how many hours do we have? What's our average billable rate? What's our utilization? We can start to project out into the future what the future looks like and how decisions that we make about the business could change that future outlook using some very, very simple numbers. So that's my objective for today. Um, if there is a way for the audience to chat with me, I want you to put a fire emoji in the chat. And if you can't, then I'm going to create a bunch of administrative issues for the hosts here. Drop an emoji in the Q&A. Light up the Q&A with emojis. I want to know that you're alive. I want to know that you're paying attention. I want to know that we're fired up and engaged here for this webinar. So open up Q&A, drop an emoji in there that tells me how you're feeling. 
and we're going to dive into core financials. How exciting. Core financials. All right, let's do it. So disclaimer, none of these ideas are my own. Thank you, John. Thank you, Greg. Tim, <laughs> interested emoji. Love that. Britt is fired up. Will's ready to go. Ivan is here. Ivan, good to see you. All right. I love this. Thank you so much for uh, humoring me with that. It, uh, it gives me the juice to keep going. Oh, and we have a little Zoom reactions. This is fun. Okay. Love it. So none of these are my ideas. This is all stuff that if you've been following, Jody, if you've been following Summit CPA, you're probably already familiar with. So we're going to do a refresher. When you look at your profit and loss statement, what should you be able to see? And what unfortunately do most people not see because they're working with an accountant that treats their business like it sells widgets and is so married to general accounting practice that they can't think critically about the business model. Um, you could tell I'm not very popular among the accounting community because I challenge a lot of things that they learned in business school that aren't actually relevant in the real world. So I digress. Here's what you should be able to see when you look at your profit and loss statement. The first thing is revenue. That's pretty obvious. How much money is coming into the business? If you can't see that, you probably have a real uh, systemic problem that needs to be addressed. But then the second thing that we want to be able to see is what we call agency gross income. So what is the difference between revenue and agency gross income? Well, the difference is we want to isolate what we would refer to as pass through expenses. And there might be some slight nuances here between the language that we use to describe these things between you know summit and, and parakeeto but i think conceptually will be very aligned yeah no we refer to them as pass-through expenses some of my clients refer to them as media spend these are expenses whether they're mark there's markup on them or not that we are passing through to some capacity to our clients exactly right so lots of examples of this if you run if you run a, an advertising firm this might be advertising spend if you do video production this might be production expenses you got to do a location you got to hire actors you need to rent a camera and so these are costs that flow through you onto other vendors and you're not responsible for the profitability of that money so you don't care how much it costs that vendor to fulfill the part of the service that you're buying from them what we want to isolate is all of that stuff is passing through us onto other people now markup is a question i get asked a lot here mm -hmm. we're going to retain the markup Mm -hmm. So all that we're pulling out here is the expenses. So let's be very clear. Expenses get pulled out. If you have markup on that, great. That's going to flow through to your agency gross income. You get to hold on to that. And this is going to be representative of really the true revenue of your agency. So if you run a $10 million a year Facebook advertising agency, but you spend $6 million a year on Facebook ads, what you actually have is a $4 million agency. I hate mm -hmm. to break it to you, but that's the reality. And we want to spend money like a $4 million agency, not like a $10 million agency. Can I give you all a pro tip that I uh, recommend pro to pro my tip. clients? And some of y'all may be doing this and some of you may not. I actually recommend that my clients capture both the revenue and the direct expense, the markup we capture on the P&L, but the revenue and the offsetting expense we capture on the balance sheet. So it is mm. off of the P&L and completely out of sight. And from a metric perspective, this is just much cleaner. And this also from a trackability perspective, because we sometimes will break this out by client to make sure that we're also charging them back for the things that we are incurring the expense for. It just makes that really clear. So Marcel, you may be like, Oh, don't, li that's don't listen a, to her. But that's uh, a lovely pro tip. Yeah, that's actually the first time I've heard of that methodology. And this is to be clear, I'm not an accountant, so I don't have an opinion on how you should do this on your PL. But mm -hmm. I think what we'd all agree on is you should know what these two numbers are. And when you look at your PL, you should know where you need to look to find it. And so I love this idea of putting on the balance sheet so it's not even there, it's not confusing. Because what is most people's experience when they look at their PL? The revenue is all the money that's coming in. Their pass-through expenses are considered cost of goods sold. And then they have a line that says gross profit that's telling them their agency gross income. But that's pretty misleading. And their accountant actually thinks that this is their gross profit. That's the most problematic part of all of this. So now we're making decisions based on this completely obfuscated sense of reality, which is that this is our gross margin, which it absolutely is not. This is just our real revenue. Mm -hmm. So I don't care how you structure it, but you should know when you look at your PL, where do I look to know what my agency gross income is? And let's make sure that we are isolating our pass through expenses and we're getting the right stuff in that isolation. And Summit CPA would know exactly how to do this. That is no surprise. That should be no surprise because <laughs> you wrote the book on this, literally. Okay. So now the question is okay, we have this AGI number, this agency gross income. This is the amount of money that we actually earn as a business. But now the question is well, what does it cost us to earn that money? 
because when you make a promise to the client and they give you a deposit or they pay you in full upfront, maybe those are your payment terms, good for you. The problem is you still gotta do the thing that you promised them before this is your money. And that process costs you money. And what we wanna understand is once we've earned the revenue, meaning we've delivered the promise to the client, how much of that dollar is left over? How much of that project revenue is left over so we can pay for overhead and have a profit left over? And so in order to isolate that, or in order to figure that out, we need to isolate what we would call delivery expenses. And some people will call these direct costs. Some people will call these costs of goods sold. Like this should be called costs of goods sold, but I use different language because I'm tired of arguing about semantics with accountants that, that don't follow this framework. <laughs> so we call it delivery expenses. And again, I don't care how you do it on the PL, but we should be very clear about what is it costing us to run the delivery function in the business. And the two biggest issues we see here on most PLs is that all the payroll is going into one account. All the software expenses are going into one account. But what we need to be able to do is split out, well, how much of that payroll is for delivery? And do we have you know, software tools that our team brings to the job every day that aren't just for one client, but it's our Figma subscription, it's our Adobe Creative Cloud, it's the stock footage library that we subscribe to. We need to allocate those things to our delivery function so we know, you know what are we spending on this area of the business that is designed to get work done for clients so that we have a sense of what we would call our delivery profit delivery profit. What is our delivery profit? And the relationship between these two things is what we call delivery margin. And again, this should just be called gross margin. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to call it gross margin. I wish I mm -hmm. could, but I can't because it's then deceiving. I get it. It can arguments. be very deceiving. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So that's, that's the key message here is that there's two things that we need to isolate that are rarely isolated on a PL that you would get from you know, your, your accountant down the street that is also working with your local bakery and is also, you know, doing accounting for everybody and their dog. And in order to do that, we need to isolate pass-through expenses. And then we need to isolate the payroll and shared expenses that are allocated towards delivery. And if we do that, then we have insight into the most important thing in the business, which is how efficiently do we earn every dollar of revenue? And if that's healthy, then what we should be able to do is pay for overhead and then have profit left over. And the ratios that we're looking for here is we generally want our delivery margin to be 50% or higher on the profit and loss statement. That allows us to spend 20 to 30% on overhead. And we could break that down more granularly, but that's generally the rule of thumb. And so what that means is you've got 20 to 30% or more in profit left over after you've paid yourself. And that's a healthy business. This is what we want. So this is kind of the, the highest level starting point. And again, I'm not an accountant. This isn't my bag. Summit CPA has, uh, has done all of this. Hopefully this isn't new for you, but we have to start here because this is the outcome that we're driving towards. And what I want to talk about next is what happens when we look at our business through this lens and we realize for the first time that, oh, actually the problem is here. It's not here, which is what I thought when I was looking at my PL and all I could see was revenue and profit and everything in the middle was jumbled into a bunch of accounts. And, and then my accountant kept using the word overhead and OPEX to tell me why my business wasn't profitable. So I confused that with like, oh, I need to cut my you know accounting spend and I need to find a cheaper version of Zoom to use. But like that wasn't actually the problem. There was 10% upside here. The real problem was here. So what do we do about that? That's what I wanna talk about next. I'm gonna pause and hydrate again. I'm, I'm getting on my soapbox here, Hannah. That's okay. I love it. This is exactly what we like to align on from a metrics perspective, because they do allow us to have so much more visibility into pulse checking where the problems might truly lie. So that way we can then go in and like problem solve, figure out how we can make it better and improve it. If you don't have these metrics, you can't, it's going to be very difficult to pinpoint where the problem might lie. Very, very difficult indeed. And here's the thing though, is even if you couldn't see this, if I was a betting man, and you said, hey, we don't make that much profit as a business, but we're doing, you know, a million, two million in revenue. I would bet that the problem was delivery margin. And I only say that because I've looked at the books of a lot of agencies over the years and nine out of 10 times, this is the problem. And you've probably had the same experience, mm -hmm. right? Very rarely do we look at an agency and we're like, why do you buy everyone a $900 office chair? And, you know, do you, do you really need to have a jacuzzi and, you know, catered lunch every day in the office? Like that, that doesn't happen in our world. <laughs> we're typically not overspending on overhead. The problem is we're over-servicing, we're underpricing, our team's not utilized. Those are the challenges. So 
that's what we're going to talk about next is what are the three levers that we can pull to affect delivery margin? Is everyone ready for this? I think Give they should some put more... some of our emojis in the chat yeah. if, if they're Give ready some... to jump into this part. If you're following so far, if this is exciting to you, for, if you're weird like me and Hannah and you're like just jonesing at this, we got some thumbs <laughs> up, some hearts. Some... Okay, we're, we're with it. We're having fun. Okay, so let's talk about delivery margin and the three ways to move this number. First, we want to remind ourselves of the formula for delivery margin. And so it is simply agency gross income, AGI minus our delivery expenses over agency gross income. Okay, and we'll color code these. Agency gross income is green because that's good. That's money coming in. Delivery expenses is, well, I don't want to say that it's bad, but it's money going out. So for example, if I did a million dollars in agency gross income and I had $400,000 in delivery expenses, then I would have a 60% delivery margin. Okay. it's a good delivery margin you got there. It's a very good delivery margin. I would be very happy with this if I was running a marketing firm. So let's talk about the three ways that we can move this metric using data that we have being created in our business every day that we don't need to wait for accounting or for reconciliation. We can start to look at this on a more granular basis. And here's the really cool thing. We can look at any time period in the business and any cross section of the business for all three of these metrics. They scale vertically and horizontally. So for example, I could look at a day, a week, a month, or a quarter, and I could look at anything from one project to a group of projects, to a service line, to a department, to a client. So I can start to compare anything to anything. And it's really fascinating what we can see when we start doing that. So the first one is average cost per hour, average cost per hour. And this is a proxy for delivery expense. And so the formula for average cost per hour is very simple. And if you're a project manager, you're gonna have an aneurysm. So buckle up, okay? <laughs> you're gonna think, no, there's no way it's that simple. It is this simple. It really can be this simple, okay? So you take your payroll, and this is loaded payroll, and you divide it by capacity, okay? So again, we could look at one person, we could look at an entire team, we could do this for a week, a month, a quarter, a year. And when we talk about, let's, let's qualify these things. This is where I start to have challenges, right? What is payroll? Okay, this is the fully loaded payroll to employ somebody. So it's their salary, it's their benefits, it's all that stuff that, that payroll taxes. So what does it cost you to employ this person or this group of people? And capacity is all of their time, all of it. For most people, this is 2,080 hours a year. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Marcel, they don't work 2,080 hours a year. They get vacation, they get holidays, they get paid time off. You're right, absolutely right. We are going to consider those costs, but we're going to factor it into our delivery margin target. We're going to reflect those costs in utilization based on how we measure that. And then we're going to make this a really easy calculation that doesn't require us to track down 57 different data points that are constantly fluctuating in order to calculate this number. And the added bonus of that is if we do it in this way and we don't factor all those externalities in, now when we are measuring our average cost per hour across different projects, it's horizontally consistent. It's not higher or lower in one time period or another because an externality has shifted that doesn't actually have anything to do with the profitability of that given section of work. That's a really important concept. So this happens to be actually more accurate, even though it seems less precise, and it's also less expensive. So that's, that's great. Here's an example of how we might do this. We have a strategist here. They get paid $120,000 a year. Their average cost per hour is $57.69. And just to illustrate a point here, if I wanna make a 70% delivery margin on every hour of that person's time, I need to earn on average $192 an hour to achieve that. Whereas if I have an intern here that makes a lot less money, their average cost per hour is $26.44, I can achieve the same margin with a much lower average billable rate. So this just speaks to like benchmarking around rates and things like that. It's it's maybe helpful, it maybe makes us feel good, but it's not actually that relevant because what's important is the relationship between your cost basis and the, the rates that you charge. And when you blend those things together, what you can start to see is, hey, you know, if a senior person is doing a lot of work on a certain type of engagement, and we can start to get junior people to take on more of those tasks, and we could do that through documentation, through SOPs, through processes, through training, then we can really start to lower our average cost per hour and that can either allow us to be more competitive on rates and still maintain our margins, or what I like better is we just keep charging what we were charging before and we keep the spread. 
And then that, that's a good thing. We have margin. We want margin. Mm -hmm. That's ideal. That is ideal. So that's the first lever, average cost per hour. And the big idea here is if we can focus in on specific types of work and projects and we can work to gradually lower our average cost per hour, then in aggregate, as we scale the team, what that should mean is we don't need to increase our delivery costs at the same rate that we're able to increase our revenue. So these two things start to get further and further apart over time. And if we use freelancers or contract labor, we'll feel that impact much quicker because there's a lot less latency between a decrease in average cost per hour and freelance labor because of how those contracts tend to work, that there's a much more direct line there. So that's the big idea. If we're trying to focus on how do we get more efficient here and spend less money to earn a dollar, that's the first lever. It's my least favorite. That's why I started with it, but it's still important to consider. Hannah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would say if you've worked with Summit, we do refer to this as effective cost. <clears throat> Essentially, what does it cost us? Um, and we we also look back and we track in terms of this, not only from a forecast perspective, but we also like to look at this as from a um, from an actual perspective each month too. That way we can see if this starts to teeter in such a way that we're starting to feel uncomfortable with this. Maybe, we, maybe we've maybe we overhired, like maybe this is starting to cost us more in order to employ these people than what we can make up in revenue. Like that is such an important lever and part of the formula in trying to decide how can we improve this. So I love that you bring this up first. Yes, excellent. And so this is to me like, it's important, but it doesn't really get me excited. You know, I, I like working with expensive people. They tend to be, to be fun to hang around with and they're smart and you know, you throw all kinds of stuff at them without a whole lot of direction and they figure it out. That's the nice thing about expensive people. And what I'm more interested in most of the time is how do I get my team to create more value? with the cost and the time that we're already spending on them. And so there's two levers that we can look at that really influence that. And the first one is average billable rate. This is my favorite metric. It's gonna be your new favorite metric too, I believe. Um, and this is one that you know was really crowned by the Summit team back in the day. And so average billable rate, what does this tell us? First and foremost, if you heard this number, if you heard this metric and you thought to yourself, I don't bill by the hour, so I'm gonna check out now and not listen to this, that would be a mistake. Because the beautiful thing about average billable rate is it allows you to compare any billing model to any other billing model. And it doesn't matter if the work is being done on a project basis or on a retainer basis, if you're pricing hourly or flat rates or retainers, or you're doing sprint pricing or whatever, this normalizes all of those factors and allows you to, in an apples to apples way, get a sense of what is actually making you more money for the time that you invest in it. And the reason that it's able to do that is because it doesn't care about what I would typically define as a billable hour. This is where we're gonna have some nuance, but maybe Hannah, I'll make a case for why this is, this is the language we should be using. The okay. way we measure this is agency gross income, right? So again, for any cross-section of work, could be a project, a group of projects, a client, and for any time period, could be a week, a month, a quarter. How much money do we make after we strip out our pass-through? And we wanna divide this by what we would call delivery hours. And for a lot of you, this might be the same as a billable hour, but here's why I don't use that language. Because I don't care if you build the client. That doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it can get confusing because there are situations where these two things will not be the same. Where if you're billing at by the hour, you might bill the client for 100 hours, but it actually took you 125. Because you know we messed something up and the client was a little pissed off and we didn't, we didn't want to you know, rock the boat too much. So we just ate those 25 hours, we billed for 100. So when we're measuring our average billable rate, it's really important that we use what I would call delivery hours, which is all the time that went into the project, regardless of whether or not it impacted the pricing model. And that will give us a true visibility into the actual efficiency that we earned revenue at for this given thing that we're measuring. And that to me is a really important distinction. I agree. I got to breathe. <laughs> you have done a lot of talking. It's all been yeah. very, very good. I completely agree because then whenever you're doing actual hours versus what you may have like scoped for from a billable perspective, that's going to really indicate some deficits for you and also indicate where you're being really profitable on some of your projects. So I love that you pointed that out. Yeah, 100%. And so 
you know, a lot of people are going to call these billable hours and that's fine, but I would just make sure to pay close attention to this because if you do have parts of your business that bill hourly, you're going to want to create a distinction between the definition of these things because they are not the same and they will often be different from one another. But to your point, Hannah, what this starts to unlock is the ability to ask some really fascinating questions, right? So in this example, we're comparing three different projects to each other. And if I asked 10 clients what their most profitable project was, but they couldn't see any of this stuff, they were just looking at how much money did we get paid? Nine out of 10 would say the website build was obviously our most profitable project. Look, we made more money. But when we look closer, we see that, well, actually it wasn't a very efficient project. For every hour that we spent doing this work, we only made $100. Whereas the little dark horse over here, the funnel build where we got paid 30 grand, we gave 20 of it away as pass through. But the money that we retained, we earned very efficiently. We made $200 for every hour that we spent doing work like that. We were twice as efficient. And I know that this seems too simple to be true, but if you sold every hour your team had available for twice as much money, you would make twice as much money. Mm -hmm. That's not my opinion. It's just math. Mm -hmm. That math so, is mathing. That does make sense. So that is, yes. that is math, right? Yes. And so that's the power of average billable rate is when we look at this, imagine the conversation you could have with your team around this of saying, hey, folks, let's have a look at this. Man, first of all, funnel build, high five everyone. Look, it took us less time than we expected. The client is thrilled. What can we learn from this? Is there something we're doing here that we're not doing elsewhere that might make us more efficient in other places? Or you know, do, you, do you like doing funnel builds? Because we could sell more of these because, I mean, this is great for everyone involved. And similar with the website build, you know, did we miss something here? Was there something that happened with the client that, you know, we didn't expect? Or is there something we're missing in scoping that we need to account for next time we do this? What can we learn from this? And as you start to do this and you start to earn more revenue for each hour, that can have a really significant impact on the profit of the business. And here's a little hack. If you have average cost per hour and you have average billable rate, you can now calculate what I call Kirkland brand delivery margin. And this is a really quick, directionally accurate way to get a sense of your margin on any cross section of the business, again, without needing any finance data. All you need is average billable rate and average cost per hour, which you can calculate with the things we talked about earlier. So if you're pattern matching here, this formula, average billable rate is swapping in for agency gross income and average cost per hour is our proxy for delivery costs. So now you can get a sense roughly like, oh, this project had a probably a delivery margin around this. And this you know, service line versus this service line has a profit margin of roughly this. And you can really start to get a sense of what's driving value in the business. So that's a little, little hack for everyone. I love that. And I also would point out, because I just ran into this with a client that we onboarded towards the end of last year, is if I look at their average bill rate, if I look at their margin on their product, on their projects, they look really good. But then whenever I pull a full PL and I see what the bottom line net income is for the year, it was 1.8% on the year. Mm. So it is important to note that these are only some, these only tell some pieces of the story. What yes. you're probably about to hit on next is the other piece that really, really starts to link everything together and put it together. So I would say like it, do not get pigeonholed into looking at just yes. one of the these things because it only tells you just one piece of the story. And like a great host, you tee up the segue perfectly oh, because look there. I'm so because glad you are so right. There is one big piece, one, one big thing that we still have to talk about here, which is the, what I call for the star Wars nerds in the room, the dark saber of agency metrics. It has great power, but it can do great harm if it's not well understood and it's not used properly. And that is a metric we're all familiar with, I'm sure, utilization. Some of us might get hives when we hear that word because we might have worked in a consulting or an advertising firm 10 years ago where this was the only metric that anyone paid attention to. And so we lied on our timesheets and we spent twice as much time doing things as we needed to just so that we wouldn't get reprimanded for not having a high enough utilization. That, by the way, is the wrong way to use this metric. But it is still very important because what this asks is the question of for every hour that we buy from our team in bulk, because that's how a service business works. I buy 2,080 hours of your life for a fixed price. I try to resell as much of it as possible for a profit and everybody wins. You make a steady income, we make a profit and the client gets what they wanted. If I can do that, the business works. But in order for that to work, we have to sell enough of your time because if we're not selling any of it, we have a problem and you're probably gonna lose your job. Nobody wants that to happen. And so the way we calculate utilization, again, this is going to seem too simple, but there's a justification for this, is we take our delivery hours 
and we divide that by, again, capacity. And so notice, again, I'm using delivery hours. I don't care if it was billed to the client. I care how much time it took you to do the work. And we're going to see the cost. I know some people right away, they'll be like, oh, but if we didn't bill for the hours, then is it really utilized? And it's like, well, yes, you still had to spend the time to do the work. The team was still busy. We're going to see the impact of over-servicing when we look at average billable rate. So don't worry, it's going to show up. You, get, you just have to look at all of these things side by side. And then capacity, similarly, it's all of the time that is available. And this includes everyone on the team, even the people that have do any client work. And this is where we're going to see the cost of holidays, time off, non-billable staff, inefficiency. We're going to see it here now because it's going to lower our utilization rate. And it's going to show us the true reality of how much of our time can we actually spend doing client work. And this is what makes this metric so hard to benchmark because half the firms that you're comparing yourself to, they're only looking at the billable team and then they're only looking at how many days they're in the office and then they're going to strip out non-billable time and then they're going to start calling working on the company website a billable hour and all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, we have a 95% utilization rate and I call bullshit. That's not true. <laughs> if you are, then you need to be investigated for you know taking advantage of your staff because nobody can work that many hours and be productive. This is probably just not the way that they're measuring it. So this is utilization and this is really important because if this is not being managed well, the problem with our business model is every day our capacity expires, right? So you have a set number of hours every single day that you get from your team. And if you don't use them by the end of the day, they go in the trash. It's a really scary thing. Our inventory does not have a long shelf life. So if we're in this situation where we have capacity and we have delivery hours, planned into the future and we have our target and we can see, Hey, you know what? We got a problem here. We don't have enough delivery hours to keep our team utilized and hit our target. There are only two ways to correct this. Can anyone tell me what they are? Can you tell me in the mm, chat or in the, in the Q and a, yeah, little, friends. little pop quiz. Oh, we got some questions rolling in too. Lovely. Oh, we right, we'll address those. I was so in it. You had me so engaged. I totally missed those questions. That's great. <laughs> it's a good sign. All right. That's right. So two ways to do this. The first is we decrease capacity. And if you've taken any PR training, you know that that's code for laying people off, right? So we want to avoid this. It sucks, but this is the reality. Sometimes we're overstaffed. We need to decrease capacity. The other way that we can do this is we can sell more work. Now notice the language here. This is a really important word, sell more work. What we don't want to do is go to our team and say, hey, our utilization is low. I need you to get it up. Because guess what? Your team doesn't get to decide how much work you sold, and they don't get to decide how many people you hired. So if you do that, they probably will increase their utilization. But if you're measuring these things properly, you're going to see your average billable rate go down at the same time because they're just going to spend more time doing the same stuff they were doing before. Now they're going to feel like they're busier than they need to be. Your, your clients are going to think, hey, this is the level of service that I've come to expect for the price that I'm paying. And now you have two problems. You've now got to correct this utilization problem and you've got to reintroduce some efficiency into the process. So the only way to really effectively improve utilization in a way that hits the bottom line is we have to sell more work or we need to decrease our capacity to match the work that we have coming in. And we want to try to avoid as much as possible having a situation where we're under our target for utilization. So this is, to your point, Hannah, such an important piece of the puzzle because you could be profitable on every single project, but if your team's sitting around and you're paying for a bunch of unused uh, payroll, it's, it's still not going to be healthy in your delivery margin. You're going to see your delivery margin go down as a result. That's exactly right. I'm going to answer a question from Stacy Peterson. The question is for capacity, do we include non-billable employees like accounting or sales? When we look at capacity, we do not include non-billable employees. We look at the people who we can actually bill their time, who can impact our revenue going forward. So, so this is where we would be doing things slightly differently. We do include okay. all non-billable staff in our measure of utilization when we look at the entire agency. Now, if we were looking at a specific department or we we're looking at an individual, we would not be including them. So if they fall in the cross section, they fall in the cross section. But this comes back to how we think about delivery margin. Because whenever we're looking at delivery margin, we're doing payroll allocations. So the cost of those people is is accounted for in the PL. But when we look at utilization for the entire agency, and this comes back to how we do our model, we include everybody. Because again, we want to see the cost of that staff. And what this allows us to do is model the capacity of the business 
at any point in time. So we could sit back, build a list of everybody that's on the team. You might have some people that are kind of like half and half. It's like, oh, you know, they're mostly sales and marketing, but they hop into client projects every once in a while. So you do those allocations. And then here's what you can do. Hopefully this will help clarify things. What you can start to do is actually look at it in the future using this methodology. Let's say we have, this is a simple example, a team of five people with 10,000 hours of capacity. And again, we're including everybody on the team. In the first model, they can be leveraged at a 50% utilization. And in second, and the second thing here is they have an average billable rate of $100 per hour. So this team can generate $500,000 in agency gross income if this is what they achieve. They'll spend 5,000 hours doing client work for every hour on average, they'll earn $100. If they can increase that utilization to 60%, then they can continue to earn their average billable rate. They can now do $600,000 in agency gross income. And if they can maintain that 60% utilization rate and they can get up to, let's say $125 per hour, by the way, they can do that by increasing their prices. Yes, but they can also do it by just getting more efficient, spending less time doing the same work. Mm -hmm. Now they can do $750,000 in agency gross income. So think about that for a second. We just went from 500K to 750K. Let's imagine that this company had a $300,000 delivery expense. So this is delivery. And then the rest of their payroll and expenses were allocated to overhead and they were spending $150,000 on that. So in this first example, we have a delivery margin of 40% and we have an EBITDA of 10%, right? They make 50 grand on 500K. In the second example, we have a 50% delivery margin and a 25% EBITDA. They're now making, if you can do the math, $150,000 on 600K. And the last example, we have a 60% delivery margin and a 40% EBITDA. So this is the impact that these simple levers have on the profit of the business. And when we simplify the numbers this way, we can just start to do this math really from any point in time. And we can account for the cost of, because the thing is, if you hired like 10 non-billable staff, you would see that now reflected in this model. You would see their costs show up here. You would see that cost reflected in utilization. So that is the reason that we do it. And it's because we have this other model tied to the back of it. Sure. One thing that I will also say to, for everybody is that I've seen with some of my clients is they are incentivizing their team based solely on utilization. And I, what I see is that drives some really bad behavior. Kind of oh, like yeah. you said, like we're just putting time in to be putting time in for the sake of time towards certain projects or whatever it is, maybe they're just not being efficient. So I would just encourage you, if you're going to incentivize your team based on utilization, that you also take into consideration other pieces of the puzzle as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I, I really hate that there's only one context where I've seen utilization as the sole kind of indicating metric be successful. And that is in a pure time and materials environment where it doesn't matter how much you over service the client, they're going to pay you for all the time anyway. Sure. So like, and how often does that actually the case? basically never. (laughs) So I think the argument for saying, oh yeah, we're just going to like hold everybody to utilization is pretty much null and void. It almost never ends up actually driving better profitability, but it does end up to your point, creating a really crappy culture, having people be overworked, over-servicing clients. And so I think this more nuanced approach at the very least counterbalance it with average billable rate, Mm -hmm. but probably more simply just focus on delivery margin. It's naturally tensioned. There's a question here that I want to answer around uh, how do we treat contractors in this model? And I want to differentiate between contractors in the sense that that's the contract by which they're getting paid and contractors in the sense that we pay them only for the hours that they work, because Mm -hmm. those two things are, are not quite the same. We talked to a lot. I just talked to an agency owner today where they have a bunch of people that work offshore, but they get paid a salary and they still have to be utilized. So we would include them in utilization in the same way that we would an employee, because the the only thing that differentiates them from a T4 employee is like the the tax treatment of their income. But objectively, when we think about the model of the business, we're still buying their time. We still need to utilize it. And if we're slow, they're still getting paid. That's the important consideration. Whereas if somebody only gets paid for the time that they work, generally, there's some nuance around this, but generally they now become a pass-through expense. There are ways to model this so that they're factored into utilization, but their utilization should be 100%. Right, so that's yeah. really the key question. Mm-hmm. 
So yep. good questions in the chat from both Luke and I think Colby also asked that question. Yeah. And I love that Debbie pointed out too, that this will work for any service-based industry. I actually have a client that is um, a, an attorney. And so we apply a lot of these same exact concepts to that industry as well. Like it truly is, there's a lot of overlap and like, there's just a lot that can be duplicated for any service-based industry. So that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, so I'm done with the main presentation, by the way, I want to encourage everyone, if you want free stuff, um, templates, cheat sheets, calculators, videos that walk through all of this stuff, go to parakeet.com forward slash toolkit. That's my plug. And now we're taking questions. Um, yes, drop them in the chat or the Q and a, if you do have any questions, uh, Gordon, you asked, can you get a copy of the slides and the link to the recording? Yes, you will get that within two business days. So our marketing team will get that over to you. So if you miss something or want to go back and hear something, a concept again, you're going to have this. This will also live on YouTube for eternity. So you'll be able to go and reference it at any given time as well. Um, Juan Pablo has a great, a great thing. So actually we do that. have, we do have this concept Juan Pablo. So this is a really important thing. we see utilization get calculated a lot of different ways. And most of the time, the reason that utilization starts to get obfuscated is for one of two reasons or both of these reasons at the same time, either the purpose of the metric is actually being framed differently. So delivery utilization is a concept that we have at Parakeeto. And what this is looking at is how much of our delivery capacity is being utilized. So for example, if we built the model of the business, we have everybody on the team and then each person, right? So we're gonna have like Tim and Tim is gonna work for 40 hours a week, right? So this is his capacity, but his delivery uh, expectation is like 32 hours a week. And then you're gonna have like vacation, right? Which is gonna be like 23 days per year. And you're gonna have other things that you're gonna strip out. And so when you run this model, then you can figure out, okay, on an annual basis, Tim has, let's say 1500 billable hours available or delivery hours available. You could do this for the whole team and then you can sum all this up and this is your delivery capacity. And then of course you can multiply that by your average billable rate. And now you get a sense of like, okay, this is how much money we could earn in that time period roughly. And so the question of how much of our delivery capacity are we utilizing is a very different question than what is our utilization as a company for the purpose of measuring our financial efficiency. The question of how many of our delivery hours are we utilizing is more a question of like, how good are we at resource planning, right? It's more of a project management kind of tactical focus. Mm -hmm. It's not the same question. And so there are variations on utilization that are useful, but they're useful for different purposes. And the important thing is to make sure that they're differentiated in terms of how they're calculated and what they're called. So we don't start getting confused and you have a project manager calling utilization, you know, the same thing as your ops manager, but they're calculating it in two different ways. So it's a, it's a mm -hmm. great observation and a great question. Um, I would also say too, so I just ran into this with a client. I spent the last couple of days at their annual planning meeting. And one thing that I was hearing around the table is they're a relatively new organization. And there are some guys, people that they have on the team that have come from very corporate environments. Like they've got some really fantastic talent from Microsoft and some other really big names in the industry. And one thing that I uh, just started to hear is that they, because they've not worked in this type of industry before, did not understand some of these concepts in terms mm. of why utilization is important, why average bill rate is important, like all of these things. So I think that's also really important. Obviously it's really important for you as a business owner to understand, but it's also extremely important for your team to understand the language and the impact that their work has on all of these things as well. Do you, have you found that with agencies that you've worked with? Oh yeah, absolutely. And like, that's, that's the biggest challenge I think with our industry is that, it's for whatever reason, our concepts around measuring the business model are not nearly as sophisticated as a lot of other industries. And actually that's not really, really totally true. There is a lot of sophistication in some very mature segments of professional services like accounting and legal, but in, in the digital agency space in particular, like we just, we haven't formalized these ideas nearly enough. And thankfully, you know, people like Jody and some at CPA have been like, publishing the thought leadership for a decade, but we know that it takes a very long time for these ideas to really permeate and for things to start to become standardized. So um, yeah, it, it's a challenge and, and trying to get consistent information on this is also very challenging. Mm -hmm. So very I want to answer one other question that's in the chat. I just dropped my pen, so I'm going to have to go get that. But what delivery margin should we be aiming for? It's a great question. 
And I want to differentiate. See how smooth that was? I want to differentiate so between <laughs> two, two different levels, right? Because they're not going to be the same. The first is at the agency level. And the answer to this question is you got to work backwards from your net profit target. So if you want to make a 30% net profit as a business, and you know that you're going to invest pretty heavily in overhead, so you're, you're going to plan to spend 30% of your agency gross income on overhead, well, then you need to have at least a 60% delivery margin. In our case at Parakeeto, we also want to invest in research and development, but we don't want that to come out of our bottom line. So we're setting our target even higher than that. So it is kind of an individualized thing, but the general rule of thumb is at the agency level, if you can be at 50% or higher, then you're giving yourself optionality and it's very likely that you will be profitable and that you'll have a lot of control over that profit. That you can choose to reinvest or pull more money out and the, it will feel like the business is happening to you as opposed or for you as opposed to to you at 50% plus generally that's the experience you'll start to have now the thing to keep in mind is that on a per project or a per unit level you're going to have a higher delivery margin because you're not going to be really reflecting on a project level utilization or shared delivery expenses and so on a project level we typically encourage you to aim for 60 to 70% or more. And the reason for this is because you're generally going to have a drop off of 10 to 20% in your model between the project level and the agency level. And this is going to be for essentially the time that your delivery team has available, but isn't going to be billable. So for every person on your delivery team that like has a 40 hour capacity, but they only work 32 bill hour, billable hours a week, you need to factor that into the delta that you have between the agency and the project. And again, the reason that we do this is because if we start to couple utilization to our project or unit level delivery margin, then it's no longer horizontally consistent. So you can't ever compare a project from one time period to another. And it's very hard to see if things are actually getting more or less profitable. This is really important to me because it's like, if I looked at a website from six months ago and a website from today, and the website from today looks like it's way less profitable than the one we did six months ago. But the reason it looks that way is because we were just more utilized six months ago. Well, that's not actually a reflection of whether or not this project was more or less profitable. So this is part of the reason that we try to isolate utilization from creating variability at this level. And again, we factor that cost into our drop off rate and how we set targets between the PL and the agency. So we account for the cost, but we isolate those things so that they're consistent. Hopefully that answers the question. I know we're at time. I could keep talking for way too long about this. Is it weird? Oh, I know. Same, same, totally same. I I totally could as well. Obviously, I geek out on this kind of stuff. I talk to my clients about this stuff every single day. So um, obviously, I would love to keep going. However, for the sake of everybody's time, I am going to wrap us up. If you would like to keep learning, we do cover a lot of these topics on our podcast, The Virtual CPA Success Show. So I'll give a plug for Jody, Jamie, and Joey for that show. Highly encourage you to listen to that. You can keep learning on our blog too. So that is another way that you can get plugged in and get involved. We also have a free ebook. You're going to get this in your slide deck that you're going to get in your email in a couple of days if you um, don't have your phone nearby. So that way you can scan that QR, QR code. But that is completely free to you. And that wraps us for the webinar. So thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to join us. And thank you, Marcel, for coming and sharing this with us. This was really a lot of fun. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Thank you.